Hey, good morning. Welcome to the leadership section. Our first uh, section is an open panel, know what I wish I have known. Each of the panelists is going to introduce themselves and <clears throat> Hayley Falconer and Andrew Perez are the moderators for the panel. All right, good morning, I'm Andrew Perez. Um, I'm one of the board members from PNCWA and Haley asked me to start things off. And when she um, asked me to kick things off today, I was trying to think about what to talk about. And the first thing that came to mind actually was emergency management. But don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about NIMS training or ICS or any of that stuff. What I was thinking about was the 15 years I spent as a public servant, both in Western Washington and Chicago. And I thought about all the time that got spent looking to the future and putting together plans and usually figuring out and detailing what those risks were and identifying them and figuring out a, a plan to mitigate them and then also to train people up so that they're ready. What I also thought about is that I'm an engineer by, by education and I'm an engineer by profession. And we deal in a world of equations where two plus two equals four and A plus B equals C and stuff like that. And everything's very logic and very hard and fast. And so when I found myself in a supervisory role as an engineer, those equations didn't really work so well. Um, it's just kind of a different rule book. It's a different skill set. And I was like, well, how am I going to make this jump from the technical realm to the leadership realm? So a couple of my friends said, oh, you should read this leadership book and you should do this. And I'm not much of a, like a Tony Robbins, Joel Austin guy. I'm not looking to be the best version of myself or any of that stuff. It's just not my style. Um, I, I don't know. That, that's why I was only a supervisor. I never got above. That's probably what the issue was. But yeah, Elmo. Yeah. But what I realized was, is I'm a person that likes to learn by doing. And so I, I started looking at uh, the public works leaders around me and how they would handle themselves in meetings like that town hall on that project. That's kind of contentious. How do they handle themselves? How do they talk? Um, how do they handle themselves in one of the many louder mills I found myself in when I had a grievance against me, right? What about those meetings where they were talking about the vision? How did they put together this plan? How are they trying to kind of sell it to everyone? How, what messaging were they doing? So I was just trying to absorb and, and do all that stuff. And so um, I hope to one day be a more than a supervisor um, with the public works and so today, I think about this as an emergency exercise management for myself, because what I want to do is I want to sit back and I want to hear the stories of the people up here on the stage. Um, and even though it looks like I'll be on my phone, I'm going to be taking notes, okay? But I want to hear their stories. I want to hear their perspectives. I want to learn from them and hopefully have a conversation amongst everyone here. And that's going to help me put together my plan for the future. So thank you. Oh, I, oh, sorry. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have our panelists come up and introduce themselves. Or, or you can say, you got a microphone, so you can go ahead and. Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm John Beecham. I'm public works director for the city of Post Falls. And I've been with the city for about eight years. Before I was public works director, I was utilities manager. So supervising our water and wastewater operations. Um, I'm also on the board for PNCWA, I'm board secretary, and have been on various committees throughout the years. Uh, Post Falls is a, a very quickly growing community. We, in 2021, saw 8% population growth. Uh, that, that would keep anybody busy, and that was a, a slightly busier year, but the rest of our, I don't know, the last 10 years have all been uh, significant growth in Post Falls. That growth has been mirrored in the city staff and complexity, uh, our fleet, which is now something I'm responsible for. Uh, we add vehicles every year. Um, that, that translates just into more work, more PMs, more things like that. So not only is the city growing in terms of personnel, but the complexity of managing that personnel and caring for it uh, grows every year as well. Um, Coupled with that, as you might expect, our wastewater plant is growing. Uh, we're a three MGD plant. When I started, we were just over two. So uh, going 
50% uh, flow increase over my eight year time with the city. Uh, that has been coupled with some really fun regulatory challenges. Uh, we are on the Spokane River where the last discharger in Idaho, or as I like to say, the first discharger in Washington. So we are uh, coupled in with the DOTMDL that is on the Spokane River. Uh, that has caused us to have a 10 year compliance schedule in our uh, NPDES permit. Uh, that has driven some significant plant upgrades. So we are currently in the midst of adding membrane filtration, plate settlers ahead of that, as well as expanding the plant from four to five MTD. So that on top of growth has led to a, a really interesting and fun and challenging capital improvements projects schedule for the last few years. Um, the, the city itself is also an interesting place. The, the demographics are uh, a growing community. So there's a lot of folks who are coming into the community that do not necessarily know the history of that 10 year compliance schedule. Uh, they, they don't know where Post Falls has been. So there are some acceptance things that are fun to work through as well. Uh, overall, the city has a really young staff. Uh, there were a small number of staff 15 years ago who um, were growing with the city, but then we experienced the um, retirement wave that everybody expected had been coming. So we have been uh, adding new staff and replacing some of our senior staff over that eight year time that I've been there to where we have uh, folks who are learning as they go in their roles right now. And that also leads to a lot of fun things. So I think I'll cut that at, or make that my introduction and we'll cover the rest in questions. Thanks, John. My name is Jenny Coker. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Sandy, Oregon, which is located uh, on the foothills of Mount Hood. It's about 40, 45 minute drive out of the Portland metro area. Um, I've been in this industry for 22 years. I started with Corolla as a consultant for five years. Um, I was with Kennedy Jenks for 12 years, a lot of wastewater process design, alternative delivery, went to the city of Portland, um, Columbia Boulevard, Tryon Creek plants um, for four and a half years. Like I've said, I, I've been in this position for seven months. I'm also an outgoing PNCWA board member. City of Sandy is it's a beautiful place. It's, it's a rapidly growing community. It's one of the fastest growing communities in Oregon. It's also still got a small town feel. The council is, is really wonderful. They're all there for the right reasons. They want to make it a livable community for their children and their children's children. Really committed. It's very inspirational. Sandy sits on an island. It's bordered by the Sandy River, a bluff, the mountain. They're kind of on their own. And as a result, we have our own transit system. We have our own fiber system. Sandy kinds of prides itself in sort of that can-do attitude. And um, it's just reflected in the people who work there. As with many towns that are facing growth, um, there's been very little investment into the infrastructure and maintenance over the years. And that's coupled with the staff that maintain the city. Like uh, my superintendent's here and you know, we share staff, but I think we have a mighty team of maybe 11 now, and we do development engineering, engineering, CIP, the wastewater utility, the water utility, the streets, and the stormwater, and snow plowing. Um, we do have some significant wastewater challenges. Sandy has um, an advanced treatment plant that discharges to Tickle Creek, which flows into the Clackamas River Basin. And the Clackamas River Basin is part of three basins covered by the three basin rule. Um, that was a ruling set in the 90s to protect pristine watersheds. Flows to the Clackamas River water. I actually get my water from there. What it means for us is that there's a very hard mass load limit and we are approaching that mass load limit and need another place to discharge our effluent for the growing community. Also unbeknownst to me, along with the water reuse theme, Sandy has had a robust functional water reuse plan for the last 20 years. For six months out of the year, from May through October, every single drop of our effluent goes to um, a nationally known specialty tree nursery. Um, it's a thousand acre parcel, they're an amazing, 
and it's it's really challenging because you know there were some historic floods in june and they didn't need water for irrigation and it you know it's it's challenging to meet our permit coupled with this they've been looking at um an alternative discharge. So a lot of work's been done um, to get a second outfall for a discharge on the Sandy River. It's really complex. I've heard there hasn't been a new outfall like this in 20 years time. There's a lot of environmental concerns, um, a lot of high level scrutiny. When I came in, um, everybody knows costs are going up, planning level costs are pretty low. And one of the discoveries is the plan was to build a second plant elsewhere in the city. Right now that that is just not affordable. It's a pretty big complex project. So I'm embarking on a facility plan amendment that's looking at consolidating our system. And I, I think building out at the existing plant. We are also going through a huge collection system rehab process. In the last two, three years, we've inspected and cleaned four of our basins through CMGC. It's been, we kind of joke, we have the sandy schedule. We can go to council in five days. We literally, yeah, it, it's amazing what we do. But by 2025, we have to finish doing all of our basins, inspecting them, as well as set up a CMOM program. Moving on to water, um, we do have backup water supply to the Portland Water Bureau and the Bull Run. We also have our own uh, water treatment plant at Alder Creek and some groundwater. Um, we are under the compliance order for Cryptosporidium, bilateral compliance agreement we signed in 2018. Like many of us have experienced, there have been delays in projects and staffing through COVID-19. Our water project uh, is behind. The master plan was due two years ago. It's not yet finished and we've changed the approach. I can talk about that, but I also have to rebuild our, our existing water treatment plants um, as well as build a pipeline to connect to Portland as well as finish renegotiating the 30 year water agreement all in the next five years. So we're also building a major street project right now that's gonna relieve a lot of congestion at our school and that's been a goal of the city for 30 years. So um, we're looking at a CIP of about $200 million and it's exciting and frankly, I think people can do great things. Um, but yes, I'm looking at growing my team, hiring the right people, and creating that environment that attracts people. And I think that it's, it's purpose, it's having, um, it's having an organization that respects your growth and gives you that, those meaningful, juicy projects where you're making decisions that will last for decades for the city. And many of our staff that work there live in Sandy or, or close by, so there's, there's a lot of ownership. It's, it's a really meaningful time and um, I'm really excited about what's to come. Well, I uh, just learned that I'm really glad I'm not John or Jenna, because that sounds like a lot of work. I'm Neil Jenkins with the Eagle Sewer District. Um, I, uh, I've done consulting for, oh, 10 or 12 or 14 years, depending on how you decide to uh, quantify your time in school, if you were working or not or whatever. But uh, most recently with Jacobs for about uh, 10 years. And I did a lot of the uh, major capital projects for the Eagle Sewer District. So when the old man decided to hang it up after 29 years in that brain drain of our industry and, and most of our country, um, he looked around and said, where's a young punk who wants to pick up the reins and run this for another 30 years? And uh, everyone stepped back and I was there looking around saying, what, huh, who? So I got hired. So now I get to be the uh, general manager of Eagle Sewer District and have been doing that, uh, driving people crazy for about three months now. And it's been, it's been fun. It's been, a good, it's been a good time. A couple of the things that I've uh, learned already is that uh, when you've worked somewhere for 29 or 30 years, you kind of have your way of doing things and everyone's really used to you. And then when that changes, it can be a really really big change. There's quite a bit of change in Eagle right now. Uh, definitely growth is, is topping that eight to 10%. Uh, lots of development. I get to work with developers quite a bit on their potential projects and look at what, uh, what we can do. I'm glad that as a sewer district, we only do sewer. Uh, my condolences to both of you. Doing the rest of that sounds like a lot of work. Uh, sewer is really nice to just focus on the fun part of what we do uh, rather than the rest of that. 
We have about 35,000 people in Eagle right now, and it, it's growing. It's um, known in the Treasure Valley as where the rich people live and still has its big, you know, large amount of original poor people. So balancing the million dollar homes with the trailer homes gets to be kind of exciting when thinking about equity and projects and CIPs and how all of those work together. Where should we be putting investment dollars in our time and energy? And it's been, it's been really kind of an interesting time. One of the things that I've learned is a lot of the practices we have in the district, the things we do day to day, we have brilliant people, great teams, they do good work. Now, if you look at the policies, they're about 20 years old. They're 25 or 29. You know, when, when the old general manager started, it's like, holy cow, we need to like write policies of why and how we do things. And those largely have remained in their original untouched form uh, since then. And so as I've looked at, uh, what's our emergency response plan? It, the funny, the general manager on his way out handed it to me and said, yeah, you probably want to look at this. And I read, I was like, holy cow, that really was 25 years ago. And it has not been touched since. Oh, man. So just kind of interesting, wonderful practices, wonderful people, policies definitely could use updating. Uh, and and there, was a, there was a lot of run by gut on the financial side, on the operational side, folks just knew they'd been there long enough. You, you can just run it by your gut. Do we need financial projections? Oh, probably not. We know about what it's going to be. Well, that's great if you have a very experienced gut, but I don't have a very experienced gut. The only way you get that is time. And, and so coming in as a, as a new general manager, it's like, I have a quite educated gut, but it's not experienced at all. So this could be really interesting to see what kind of indigestion I cause and get to enjoy as, as we uh, work through some of these learning curves. As far as the treatment uh, plant goes, we have a lagoon system that we do essentially preliminary treatment. And then uh, in years past, we had rapid infiltration basins until one of those wonderful times where you, we were, had our RBs right next to a feedlot. And somehow... The neighbors started complaining about odors, and who was to blame? It was not the feedlot. And so huge political firestorm, big fat mess, moratorium, all that other jazz. We ended up not being able to use our RABs anymore. And, and thankfully, our friends at the city of Boise bailed us out. We built a pipeline uh, to their uh, West Boise water renewal facility, and we've been discharging to them ever since. And that, that partnership has been just terrific. Definitely appreciate that regional approach. I'm sure we've given them lots of headaches. Hopefully we've been some help along the way, but uh, definitely appreciate uh, that, that approach. Uh, looking forward, there's plenty of growth. There's plenty of opportunity as our flows become a more significant part of Boise's flow that, uh, that changes things a little bit. It used to be that we were less than the wash water that they would use on the belt filter presses. Now we're closer to 10% of their flow and things are changing a little bit. Besides our treatment plant connected to Boise, there's a large development just north of town that is expected to be about 7,000 homes and a new treatment plant not connected to our existing one that, that will have a, a lagoon treatment system and do class C reuse in the beginning and then class A reuse as, as it gets built out. So some kind of, kind of fun challenges and uh, lots to look forward to. All right, thank you. I'm gonna thank Andrew because he was double booked and this was, he doesn't have a time turner from Harry Potter so he can't actually be in two places at once. So he's got to run somewhere else. Um, I think, yes, of course, the work that you all have shared is hard but I hope um, that folks can get a sense already in hearing from them that those challenges are, are maybe not super technical in nature, some of what they're facing. I mean, between you all, you have multiple degrees and licenses and decades of experience. And what we've heard throughout the conference is that perhaps those technical things are not the biggest challenges that we're facing. And so I was hoping um, the title of this, of this talk, we probably didn't, I didn't share certainly was um, what I wished I had known. And so while they do come to this stage with decades of experience, you've heard pretty early in their careers as, as directors and general managers, which is on purpose, because I think important for our dialogue here and to hear from them on what they wish they had known before they were in these roles. And so I was hoping maybe starting with John, if you could each share 
just something that has surprised you, something that isn't technical or you weren't trained in in your engineering degree and licensure or your operator training, but what has surprised you in your director or manager role? Uh, so this should be an easy question and maybe it's reflective of how slow of a learner I am. But looking back, there's a lot of things that surprised me at the time that shouldn't have. Uh, the amount of time that would be spent on relationships versus technical and uh, financial things. In hindsight, I should have known that getting into the role. So the, the question was challenging just because uh, some of the surprises in hindsight seem a little obvious. Now, what I kind of settled on is actually a quote from an Avet Brothers song, uh, tell the truth to yourself and everything will fall in place. Uh, really, every opportunity, every challenge that we have encountered has been an opportunity to build trust either with staff or with council or with community. And I was not expecting that. I was expecting uh, contention and problems along the way. And the way that's worked out is by being honest about what the problems were and then being able to find and deliver and, and work through a solution with people has uh, been a surprising trust builder as opposed to just things are going good, things are going well, uh, there, there's no problems here. Uh, working through those issues has actually, I think, strengthened relationships where getting into the role I would have seen it the other way. And uh, I know in hindsight, I was much more nervous talking about things that weren't going well when I started than now when I realized that's actually just an opportunity to build trust. Neil, how about you? Three months in, what, what, a, what surprise? What's something that surprised you? So when we get to our first wastewater class, the first thing that we learn is MOP 8, MOP 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and 28, and all of those, or m &E, they are the Bible. They are the way to do wastewater. And what was surprising to me is when I asked uh, both the general manager who's outgoing as, as well as my mentor, so like, where's the Bible to do this? Because I don't want this utility be, to be run according to the gospel of St. Jenkins. I don't want to write that. I don't want this to be something that I made up. The answer from the old general manager was, uh, uh, you just kind of do it. And I thought, oh, dear. I don't, I'm, I'm coming from a technical background where we have standards, we have calculations, and even in some of those uh, fuzzy areas where you have to start using imaginary numbers, uh, at least you know that you can divide by a square root of negative three and stuff blows up, but you expect that. Uh, I didn't, I was really surprised that there wasn't a better kind of universal, this is how to do things. I am happy to report that uh, a couple months later, I now know what I'm considering, uh, that Bible of how to run a utility. I've learned that, um, that WEF and WERF and uh, a APWA and AWWA and all those other acronyms, and aqua, 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 you know, all those cool people, they actually came together years ago and put together a, this is how you run your utility. I thought, terrific. I can finally have a guy to go to a MOP8, an m and &E, that I can uh, model my utility after. And that was, that's called the effective utility management framework. And that has been so wonderful to, to, first of all, recognize that, well, we certainly weren't following it because we didn't know it existed. And now that I know of it, now I've got a lot of work to do to say, okay, how do effective, or how do utilities effectively run? And that's been terrific, a big surprise and a big relief uh, thankfully, all within a short amount of time rather than years later learning that lesson. This is a really hard one. There were so many surprises. So trying to say something that's different. Um, where I came from in Portland was extremely collaborative and inclusive. And I, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. I also think sometimes organizations can be like a little too stuck in that and there's too many meetings and it was interesting in Sandy that the previous public works director really kept a lot close to the vest and handled a lot and didn't share a lot and didn't um, include the, the whole team. And I've started doing that and I, I have a lot of goals, emergency management, workforce development. What has surprised me is 
you know, I start saying goals and ideas and I come back to another meeting a month later and, you know, we have uh, one of our crew leads, Jake, did so much research about emergency communications coordinated with Clackamas County and the police department. I was blown away at the amount of research he had done and how well he presented it. So I think the surprise is just, if you have a motivated team and you know people will latch onto their goals, they will just surprise you in how well and how thoroughly they move your goals forward. Uh, kind of building on that, Jenny, and part of your opening as well, um, I'll start with you, but wanna hear from each of you. I mean, they have big jobs. Uh, and certainly we heard a little bit, maybe just in the intro about partnerships or not doing it alone, bringing your team in. But can you each talk about how key partnerships have played a role in your utility leadership and maybe what advice you would have for other utility leadership or other utility leaders around building key partnerships? Um, well, I guess I can talk about the Portland Water Bureau because we are one of the wholesale customers. We will remain a wholesale customer. Um, they have been incredibly helpful to me. There's a, a very complex agreement about water use. There was a lot of coaching that was done to me to help manage some additional water we took, a lot of help and coaching with the agreement, um, and just honestly, a lot of collaboration. We made a late change to decide to connect to the plant and were included in the design. Um, what I, what, the advice I would give is, it's surprising how many organizations you're invited to as a public works director. There's a Clackamas County Regional City Engineer Conference. So Lake Oswego is on there. Actually, P Portland Bureau of Transportation Chief Engineer is, is in there. Happy Valley is in there. You know, and everything, there's an emergency management thing. Everything I'm invited to, I try to attend. And that's really hard because I'm really busy. But you get key information. Like I, I was running into some delays with PGE moving some poles for a street project. I asked these people and they were like, this is really common. This is how we do it. We have a quarterly check-in with PGE to try and advocate for our projects, check in for where we are. This is the person to call. And so I, I think it's just putting yourself out there, responding to those calls, starting to build those relationships and, and sharing your knowledge. I I have a lot of expertise in wastewater and construction. You know, I, I was sharing bid tabs. Just try to answer those calls and try and be there because what we do is really complicated. Like no one's an expert in everything we do. Core permits, SHPO, you know, those regional organizations are really key to you understanding who to call when your project's delayed to get it moving forward. And that's, that's a huge part of your role with the relationships is doing the right people to like, I'll use my old boss's term, apply the grease to where a project is stuck and get it moving again. John, how about you? Five years in your role, where have key partnerships worked and, and what advice do you have? So I, I would echo everything Jenny said, those external partnerships and knowing who to call are critical. Um, trying to expand our collective answer a little bit, I'll focus internally. Uh, when I started as a director, the police chief, so a fellow director, took me out to coffee and said, really, there's one thing you need to know. Your, your job is to help the city administrator help the city be successful. It is not to run public works. It's not to do the projects. Your job is to help her help the city be successful. And I took that to heart, and it has probably been the best advice I received as far as being a director. Those internal partnerships uh, with my boss and with the other departments have allowed things to move to have grease and move forward much more easily than if I was living in a silo and kind of fighting uphill battles along the way. Uh, I think my, my best partnership out of that is with our city attorney. His office is right down the hall and that has been amazing. Uh, to both having in-house counsel is amazing, but we run into each other in the hall and we strategize on things. Uh, I would have expected to try to avoid the city attorney that usually doesn't <laughs> indicate you're doing things right. But in fact, it's the opposite. The, the more I can talk to him about where things are headed, where they should be headed, uh, the better we are when we actually get to that spot. And then uh, a very personal example, I, um, I guess I'm not happy to say that I had a lot of friction with our HR director when I started at the city. 
Uh, we saw things differently. We still see things really differently. And I tried to solve that through writing better emails than she did. And <laughs> uh, that is not the best way to solve that. So after a lot of years of failing to make any progress there, we started just a monthly sit down together and talk about things. Usually we talk about kids and hiking. That, that's how we open the meeting. And we then talk about the contentious HR issues, my issues, her issues citywide. And we have built a relationship to where even when we don't agree, we can go sit in a meeting, uh, the two of us, and come to some agreement about how we're going to move forward. And five years ago, it, that was actually the opposite. If we were in a room together, it was contentious and it didn't work well. So intentionally building that internal partnership with a department that I struggled with has been immensely rewarding. Neil, anything to add on key partnerships? Well, since we've touched on, touched on excuse me, the external stakeholders and in, internal folks, maybe something to add would be um, the relationship with mentors. Um, one of my former coworkers, uh, when I took this job, said, you know who you ought to get to know because they run a utility, right? You really need to get to know John Peterson of Clark Regional. That guy knows how to do things. And it helps that he was an engineer for all those years. And so he has some idea of how to do things. And uh, that, that to me has been just an invaluable relationship to learn from someone who's been there, done that, and can, and often when we have our bi-monthly check-ins to say, so what am I likely failing at now? And he'll say, oh, you're probably thinking. And it's like, well, yeah, I actually am. And is that good or bad? Well, that's bad. So let me tell you how you should be thinking and what actually works because you're going to have those same pitfalls that, that I fell into, you know, as a, as a younger man. So external partnerships on the mentorship side for me has already been very valuable. All right. I want to make sure that we end up leaving enough time for you all to ask questions. So please be thinking about your questions. I'm going to try to get a couple rapid fire in so that we can get something quick. Um, close out this and, and certainly leave room for questions. So maybe just, and I'm picking the hardest topic for rapid fire. So please forgive me for that. Uh, you're all here early and I want you to come back, but just let's talk about workforce. Maybe give us the like topically, what are the two biggest workforce issues that you're facing right now? Uh, Jenny, why don't you start us off? Um. The city tried to hire an assistant public works director, which um, would help manage the group, but really would be a project manager for all our, our concurrent projects. And they couldn't fill it for a year and a half. And uh, we, we did advertise it. We only got one candidate. And, you know, a, a lot of what the inflow candidates resonated with me. I, I looked at the advertisement. They want so much. The advertisement says, we want so much experience. We want all these criteria. And then we're going to pay this. And, you know, and so I, I intentionally rewrote it. I, I said hybrid work. I, you know, you have to really distill down what do I need? Do I need someone with a PE? And I was like, I think this is a barrier. It would be great to have someone with a PE, but I, I need someone who's, who's diligent, who can coordinate and takes ownership of the project. They don't have to be a PE. I even considered someone working fully remote. We ended up getting a really great candidate, but I did a lot of outreach as well. And um, my goal is People are attracted to jobs with purpose, and I, I'm trying to create a culture which has a wonderful workforce where you average 80 hours a week. I'm, I'm very intentional about that. I, I want to really invest in the training and development of my people, and I think people will be attracted to that, but it's hard, the benefits and the salary. I think she means 80 hours of pay period, not a week. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I pay two weeks, eight, 80 hours in two weeks. Sorry. There was some shock in the audience. And so I was going to help you. I really don't want your job now. <laughs> Neil, uh, workforce, two, two things. Yeah. One so thing, what's been interesting to me is just looking at the demographic of who I have on staff. Um, we don't do age discrimination. That's illegal. But like everyone's the same age. <laughs> 
So like they're all going to walk out the door at the same day. So we're trying to hire uh, young punks, but young punks are hard to get trained up. It's just kind of an interesting conundrum that we're working on trying to figure out because if they all walk at the same time, then we're in big trouble. John? Uh, so share the experience and, and workforce challenge there, trying to find people with experience to hire. But I'll focus on housing. Uh, average price of uh, the median price of a house in Post Falls has, I believe, now eclipsed half a million dollars. And uh, there's nowhere around that has a, a better value for that uh, anywhere nearby. So uh, not only can we not hire operators, we can't hire office staff, we can't hire most any position uh, at that rate or, and have them afford to buy a house. So housing is a huge issue for workforce for us. Um, we've, we've made offers and had them turned down. We've started in our interview process really early saying, hey, I know you're interested in this position in moving here. And before we go any further with this, have you looked at the housing situation? And a lot of people say, yeah, I just did that. And thanks anyway, I'll, I'll not waste your time further, which is, it's really disheartening because that the housing prices in our region might stabilize. I think that would be the, the best case scenario. The, the forecast for people wanting to move to Kootenai County is not for it to decrease. So, so housing costs by far and away the biggest challenge we have right now in workforce. Okay, um, I just really wanna thank our panelists. Don't go anywhere because we're gonna get some questions for the audience, but you all are wonderful. And I think you've really made the case for the need, hopefully for more of this, for dialogues with our utility leaders and for chances for you all to connect with one another. And I committed at breakfast this morning that I was gonna put myself on the spot up here to say that next year, I really hope that we expand this and have a, a focus area for our utility leaders across the Pacific Northwest to have a candid conversation with one another. So you heard it here first folks, it's 836 on Wednesday morning. So next year, please tell your utilities, the folks you work with, that that is going to be a thing. We have about four minutes. I'm hoping we get some questions from the audience. I'd love to surprise them with some questions since they knew about the ones we were talking about up here. So who's got a question for us? Thank you, Anna. I was going to apply for that job, but I saw the 80 hours and I was out. Uh, I'm also a public works director of a small town, worked up from the operator to director. My question is this, we all know uh, the value in team building. How do you determine how much of your time to invest into training up staff, leadership or otherwise? And what percentage of your time do you invest in that? Go ahead, John. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I don't think that we have intentionally set an amount of time for training. It has been somewhat of an organic process. Our uh, operations staff do a lot of mentoring with our new crews, and we're hiring folks to be operators who come to us often without a license or with no IT license and generally very little experience. We've hired a lot of kids out of high school. So a lot of time is how much we spend on training and mentoring. And uh, our projects division manager recently hired a project manager. And that was my advice to him. Expect to spend quite a bit of your time mentoring this new hire. It will pay off in the long run, but uh, expect to devote a significant amount of your time to, uh, to showing him how to do things and, and why to do things. I can talk about the team building aspect. Um, we meet twice a month with the public works crew and we're trying to integrate our Veolia crew because they're part of our team as well. And that's been really successful. Like John said, it has been a pretty organic process. We had um, one of our crew members recently celebrate 20 years. He's really, really shy. We had just kind of returned to work. And so again, one of the team organized a lunch that was just us, some of the public works crew. And, and it was wonderful. And we're, we're going to celebrate some other wins this fall. I've been showing some Simon Sinek videos, um, just talking about, you know, what makes an extraordinary team staying safe and how you support yourselves and just food for thought, little bite-sized pieces. Um, 
I do hope to have more formal networking and planning going out, but we're kind of, we are kind of in emergency mode every week, but it, it, it is kind of organic, but I think the important, the important point is if you chip away at things, everybody has a couple hours a month. If you spread them out and schedule those, you can actually do a lot of good and make a lot of progress. And the only thing that I'd add is that we uh, try to keep team building and staff management and training on every meeting agenda so that we don't forget it. Um, so as far as how many dollars, how many hours, how many of that, um, we're still figuring that out, but definitely have it on the agenda. So it's something we continually talk about. All right, I think we have time for one more question this morning. Maybe while somebody's coming up to the microphone, I'll add one quick thing. We added a senior operator position, and one of the requirements for that is that you have an area of expertise in operations and that you mentor young staff in that. So we're trying to build an incentive for our existing operators to train our new operators coming in and to compensate. I gotta say that's probably the best way we can end. That's a great idea. And I think that's perfect. Let's please join me in thanking our speakers.